Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, this uh, uh, Inclusively uh, episode. Uh, today, we're going to talk to uh, Rachel Collins, Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Colt. And uh, with me, I have my usual partner in crime, Chris Lewis, the founding director at Lewis, Lewis Insight. Um, as uh, as always, uh, we have these uh, uh, events to talk about how uh, we can drive uh, the, wire the wireless and telecoms market to be more inclusive. Uh, and this means uh, people with uh, uh, disability, people that are prevented to uh, access, to have uh, uh, the connectivity that they need, uh, elderly people, anything. And uh, at some point, uh, sooner or later in life, we're all uh, uh, excluded, and so uh, or we have a risk of being excluded, and we want to make sure that that's uh, no longer the case. Um, uh, after this uh, uh, event, we will have more, but I would like to uh, also let you know that uh, we will be at Mobile World Congress uh, in Barcelona on the 25th of February, and we are going to be at the MEF event. And uh, more information about that is uh, on uh, the Inclusively, Inclusively webpage um, uh, that where you can find all the information so you can uh, uh, sign up and uh, meet us in person there. Now, with that, I would like to ask uh, Chris to introduce uh, today's uh, topic and uh, guest. Thank you, Monica. Yes. Yeah, it's 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 great that we as we keep building more and more perspectives on this and talk about MEF, uh, we'll certainly look at that issue of, around. We did a panel at MEF, the Omni Channel event, a couple of weeks ago, and we'll we'll get that summarised and sent out, and you'll be able to catch it with that quite quite soon as well. But yes, Rachel, welcome welcome to Inclusively. And the, hello. And I know we we know a, we know something about Colt, but perhaps not everyone knows about Colt. So can you give us a bit of a background on yourself on Colt? Uh, and your role within Colt? Yeah, sure. So my name is Rachel Collins and I'm head of diversity, equity and inclusion at Colt. Um, Colt is a B2B connectivity um, organization. We are global. I have been um, part of the organization for, for 12 years. Um, started out working in the Marcoms team. I was working on, focused on internal comms and engagement. In terms of my current role, I started doing it unofficially six years ago and more officially four years ago. I think with a lot of, of people in the, the DEI space, well, the, the, there's lots of people who find themselves following various routes but I was doing um, DEI work extra to my my day role uh, my day job um, found that there were, I had a passion for it well I already knew I had a passion for it but found as well that I was um, able to drive change and, and it went from there so yeah. Interesting you use the term DEI we, we, we... As a, as a telecom industry, we are obsessed with our acronyms, aren't we? Oh gosh, it, yeah, we are. <laughs> how how well known would you say is the term DEI? Because I hear it called EDI. You know, is it part of CSR? It's part of ESG. Is is it a is it well understood within cult? And and how and when you're talking to your peers in different organisations, is that do you come across that? To, is that that's your obviously your accepted term? But yeah, do, is there confusion out there in the market? Um. I, I personally wouldn't say that there's loads of confusion. I think the term DEI is, is well understood um, within cult. We, we sometimes refer to inclusion and diversity, um, you know, in a, in a, as a more of a shorthand and, and um, rather than including the equity. So we talk about inclusion and diversity a lot. Mm. Um, I, I've tended, I, I network a lot with um, people doing similar roles to me and it's quite often DEI. Sometimes it's EDI and they lead with the equity. I found that more um, in the US, broadly speaking. But yeah, I would say it's fairly well understood. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. The, 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 the geographic data. Yeah, go on. ask a question. Uh, what about the equity? Because we 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 focus, uh, Chris and I focus on uh, diversity and inclusion, but, but equity is also a very important uh, equity and equality as well. How do you define that? 
or do you have a definition for that? Yeah, yeah, I do. So we we've started to talk about equity more within cult over the past year, and and what we mean by that is, you know, equality is about treating everybody equally. Equity is about treating everybody um, fairly, but not not necessarily. It's not always equally. It's ba- based on what what they might need. Um, so people have different starting levels starting positions people have different needs and actually if you treat everyone exactly the same um that that might not lead to equal opportunities in it in and of itself um equity is is about um making sure that there's equal opportunity um and actually you know removing barriers and and supporting people that's i I really like that because that's you know, in the in the world of disability, you talk about reasonable adjustment for people. So that yeah. that is exactly that, isn't it? It's, it's understanding the level and making reasonable adjustment to to yeah. accommodate people for. Oh, good, excellent. So so that plus a geographic dis- distinction, I think, is is really really interesting. Uh, yeah. One thing which is always evident when we talk about cult is is leadership. And Kerry Gilder, the CEO, since she, since she came and took on the role, she she's really gone for this gone for this even the broader topic. But yeah. can you describe describe for the the inclusively listeners and watchers, you know what 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 how Kerry drives this from the top? So we we even entitled the session, you know, driving it from the top, and that's very yes. much with, with Kerry in mind. So at the point where I officially um, took on the role of of head of of DEI at Col, um, it was around the same time as well that Kerry became CEO, and actually it was it was absolutely fantastic from my perspective um she she's passionate about this she drives it from the top because she role models it she talks about it a lot you know it's very clear spending any time with Kerry that she cares about this because because she just talks about it a lot um it's a consideration for her how can we make sure that we're being inclusive how can we make sure that this stays top of mind? Um, she, I mean, anyone who knows Kerry knows that she's constantly fizzing with ideas. You know, she's she has that real kind of change maker energy where where she's constantly um, fizzing with ideas and, and wanting to drive action. And you know, definitely with with DEI, that's the case. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If I I often rem- go back to her presentation of the. A DCW event for TM Forum yeah. in Copenhagen, and she made this presentation, and she was talking about how many paper towels get used. And I'm then going to the bathroom, and going, "I'm going to shake my hands dry." You know, I'm not, gonna, <laughs> I'm not going to use any paper towels. We use too many paper towels. So yes, yeah, she she uses the platform brilliantly to 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 do that. Um, and then I, I guess in most of the inclusivity stuff that we're doing, we have we have two sides to it. We have the the internal diversity of employment, and then we have the external customer facing. Can you give us a bit of bit of color on that on 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 both sides or start with the internal perhaps well from an internal perspective we we've we've done a lot i think in a short space of time um you know going back four to six years ago when we started working on this we were quite initiative driven um and launching a global holistic strategy was a priority. So, you know, four years ago we launched that, and actually, you know, I'm not saying that we we never um, drive initiatives. We we absolutely do, but it's it's all about creating that framework and um, building inclusion into the way that we do things. So, from an internal perspective, it's about building inclusion, building equity into the way that we do things. So, inclusion by design um it is the approach so our our policies our people processes um and 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 the accessibility that i know that we wanted to to talk about today building accessibility in right from the start it, it's not a patch it's it's how we do things you know it's it's part of the success criteria at the start um so and and from a from an external perspective, we believe it's. It, I think it's it's absolutely fundamental to the the cult philosophy and approach 
to to DEI is that you can't do it alone. No organization. A lot of the time we're talking about societal issues, societal um, environment, and we, we need to work with others in order to drive change. One company on its own can't tackle it. Um, and actually, the best way to drive sustainable change is in partnership. And we do that in formal and informal ways. You know, we 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 work with our suppliers. We um, we work with our technology partners. Um, we talk to our customers about this. Um, and in and and sometimes it's in a in a more formal kind of programmatic sense that that we that we partner up on this work. And other times it's. It's more informal, but it's it's still happening all the time, you know, sharing best practice, being part of forums, finding out what others are doing and seeing seeing if we can if we can link up. So we, we've done that a lot on the accessibility side. We've also done a piece of work this year partnering on on transgender inclusion with um, other tech organizations. Um, we're we're working with other organisations in in the neurodiversity space to understand more about that. Again, that that links with the accessibility piece as well. So, yeah, you can't do this as a lo alone as an organisation. Do, do you think yes, it helps? Well, oh, go on, go on. No, please okay. go. So, uh, when when you talk about uh, uh, the internal part. Clearly, it's important to have something, you know, coming from the top because then you provide uh, the, yeah. the sort of uh, uh, the framework. But at the same time, you also need the buy-in from everybody in the company or most of them. And in a lot of cases, that's a new concept. So it's not necessarily that they have prejudice, but they're just not used to think about it that way. So uh, how do you do? Did you find buy-in from the people working at Cole and... Uh, how did you foster? How did you send the message to everybody? Well, I mean, back when we very first launched the strategy, it was it was something that we took a lot of time to raise awareness and educate. Um, that this is about culture change. So, you know, sometimes people think about inclusion and diversity workers. You know, it's things that you do to to support specific groups, and actually, there is an element of that, but but everybody plays a part in being inclusive. It's about behaviors. It's, it's about um, being consciously inclusive because if you're not consciously inclusive, then you, you could be sub subconsciously or unconsciously exclusive. So it, there's, an, uh, there's definitely um, a message here about everybody is responsible. Everybody needs to be involved and everyone plays a part. And, and educating on that and raising awareness is key. So we, we did a lot of going out and talking to the business about this from a global perspective, but also linking in with specific teams, talking about what it means to, to specific teams. You know, what, what does this mean for, for you, your organization or your function? Um, storytelling is, is really key. And this is something that Kerry is phenomenal at so Kerry's great at using storytelling to to get a message across and really really connect with people so you know that the paper towels is a great example but th there's lots of examples that, sh that she uses you know she'll use examples from her own life where um where you know inclusion has become top of mind or to you know to illustrate inclusive behaviors and we play with that a lot at Colt um, we we get leaders to role model and story tell. We get peers. There's a lot of peer to peer um, storytelling. So one of the things that we've been doing this year is people have been taking taking the allyship pledge. We've been um, explaining what we mean by allyship because allyship is is a term that that lots of people use and our different employee networks were using it, but but maybe in in slightly different ways. And we thought we we really need to explain what we mean by allyship. It's inclusion in action in in many ways. Um, but we we we're asking people to take the allyship pledge and 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 um, pick one of the behaviours or traits that they that people want to really focus on. And we've it's gone viral throughout the organisation because we get people to then nominate somebody else to do that, and we do it all. All on our Facebook workplace tool. We've had, you know, since the summer, we've had over five five hundred people do this, 
And, you know, the next step is really sharing those examples of where people have, have done it even more so, um, where, where people have been actively listening or gone out of their way to learn more um and all of those great behaviors that lead to a more inclusive organization so yeah, can you tell us for the for our, some of the uh, people might not know what uh, the allyship uh, uh, pledge uh, pledge sorry how do you define it sorry what's the question again how do you well, define well, allyship yeah. So uh, allyship is about being actively inclusive and actually just saying that you're an ally is 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 not allyship. You actually have to be doing something. And in, in many ways, you have to be vulnerable, vulnerable and be able to be, show that you're learning and, and taking a risk. It's not allyship if, if there's it's, it's about standing up for somebody um or a group of people um, who may be un underrepresented within the workforce or um, may be subject to, to discrimination, for, exa for example. Um, but, but I would also say, it, you know, it's more than that. It's about inclusive behaviours um, and it's about being actively inclusive. Um, but, but just saying that I'm an ally, you, you know, that that isn't enough. It's, it's about what are you doing um, to, to, to role model that. Oh, great. Yeah, no, I think it's really important. Um, and in, listening to your, your previous answer, you talked about the framework. And it's interesting, when we had the Royal College of Art talking recently, they said it, often it's not about the actual design, it's about the framework within which you think about something. Yeah. And I think it is, you know, so giving someone the, it's not necessarily painting them a picture, but it's actually saying, hey, look, this is the big context, and this is why it's important. Do you think that, yeah. you know, Colt is a relatively young company compared to the big incumbent telco, certainly, yeah. you know, and its ownership structure is... Is different because of the, the fidelity as, as, as your as your parent, and I guess the age profile is is, is probably younger. Do, how do you think those things contribute to the to being able to push the the message through? Because I think in some of the bigger corporates, bigger telcos, where they've been the former incumbent PTTs, you know they've got bureaucratic structures that things struggle to get through. Is that yeah. does that help you with messaging and getting the things moving? I think it does help. It's a relatively flat structure I think at Col it's very collaborative as a culture everyone is everyone's voice is is heard really um so I, I think that helps and I think we've able been able to be quite agile um in terms of our approach to this and yeah I mean I'm not saying that we've got it perfect and we've still got a ways to go, but I, I think definitely yeah. the the culture was all, all already there as, as being quite an open culture. And, and yeah. do you so, see any so that helps? Yeah, did you see any difference for different parts of the company in different countries or different groups? I mean, is it somebody more receptive than others? Yeah, definitely. And that that's going to be the same um, in, in all organisations. You, you, you'll get pockets of organisations where, um, yeah, where, where the, the geographic landscape where a lot of the team is based is slightly different. So that the conversation with regards to inclusion and diversity might be slightly different. But I would say in Col, generally speaking, um, even though we are global we're not we're not huge so most people in some organizations you know you have to be really senior to be talking to to colleagues every day in in a different geographic location or do a really key specific role that's not really the case in cult we're constantly talking to people from different locations all the time um and i think that helps as well so it, it helps the cross pollination of ideas. It helps people to, you know, we've always talked about the importance of of cultural intelligence in cults, um, you know, for the whole twelve years I I've, I've been here. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 the foundation was was already there to some degree, um, which helps. And, and what about the, you know, with obviously you've recently closed the deal with Lumin. 
mm. and to, to, to having acquired their their European assets does that any obviously you, you can't comment on Lumen's culture but you know trying to make sure you now spread the cult culture to include all that is that how's that kicked off is that some does it I assume it's been well received because it's it, it's, a, it's an yeah. obviously it's it's it creates you've got to be inclusive of those guys as well haven't you yeah exactly exactly my impression um I, I met some of some of the Lumen um champions and met people who were involved in the the employee networks their side um a couple of weeks before the acquisition um and was just really struck by um th there was so much alignment really in terms of the way that they were talking about diversity and inclusion um compared to how we talk about it in cold there, there was so much common ground and we've just been able to build on that commonality so far so yeah we're, we're, we're about um six weeks in I think but we have done we've done a lot of um we've held discovery sessions with um our new employees who have been involved in in diversity and inclusion and really work to find that common ground so that we've got that as a basis to build upon and I'm just super excited because it means that now we've got more um more passionate champions of, of diversity and inclusion you know it's something that I'm, I'm really excited for next year great I, I want to change direction a little bit and you, mm. you, you, you mentioned accessibility and obviously it means many many different things to many to many people you know as, as a blind man it's I have a very specific requirement on accessibility. Yeah. How how accessible are you? Have you made uh, your both your internal systems processes and and I guess my my pet hate, of course, is websites and and applications that could get face out to customers. So, uh, any, any comments on the accessibility journey from those different perspectives? Oh, absolutely. Um... So we, we launched our accessibility roadmap, which is a five-year journey to improve accessibility at Colt. We launched in May this year. And that was the culmination of months and months of work. So in towards the end of 21, start of 22, we started to work on our roadmap. And what we did um, in, in 2022 was we we partnered with Atos, who is a, is a tech partner. They have a fantastic accessibility function led by Neil Milliken. And we, we knew that we, we had some enthusiastic champions with regards to accessibility at Colt and, and you know, people that, that cared about this. Um, but there wasn't really, again, going back to that framework, there wasn't the governance and strategy around it. And we wanted to make sure that we we put something around it that was sustainable rather than just going after in initiatives. And so we did a maturity modeling exercise with the Atos team. We, we included 30 stakeholders from around the business. So we were looking at this from the, the employee experience perspective, customer experience, um, our brand, how we communicate um you know how we procure um are we are we procuring accessible goods and services awareness and skills so we we had um about 10 10 hours of workshops to really really understand you know how accessible we were as an organization at that point um and what where the gap was that was such an interesting piece of work to 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 lead on and it was just it was great to work with atos who were experts in this i mean there are there are lots of people um who can probably support an organization if, if you say you know please please can you make this accessible or this accessible but actually what atos have is that really great perspective that enterprise-wide perspective you know how can you bed it within within an organization so we built the roadmap that we launched in may this year off, off the back of all of those learnings um and yeah we, we've had a really good first 
first year of work just coming into that first year at the end of q1 yeah just one one thought on that the 30 stakeholders who contributed to that is there a is there a follow-on that makes them like almost your internal accessibility council do do, do, because one of the things we're very conscious of is that you, you say people do a uh, a project an initiative but it doesn't it's not part of a bigger program and certainly in and when we had bt on recently you know they talked about the people internally who are visually impaired or different conditions who they become a sounding board in, inside the company is that yeah is that a is that a sort of follow-on that you're, you're looking yeah. at yeah yeah it is there's there's two elements of it i mean th- there were people at all different levels of the organization that were were within that stakeholder group and um, some of them have become sponsors for this within their functions um some of them have, have been pulled into specific um you know with specific roles within the program and we've also launched a community of practice and some of them those people have joined this community of practice so it's in in many ways I talk about our community of practices being our our super users you know the people who um really um are au fait with um what you know what's available within cult to improve accessibility and can signpost and guide other people so we we've asked a group of people to come with us on that journey um we're, we're holding regular sessions with this group um and and we're kind of learning together yeah how is that uh you know all these efforts you have a lot of programs that sounds very good does do you think that that also helps uh, attracting talent because we keep hearing i keep hearing it all the time and it keeps surprising me because it feels like telecoms is the best place to be right but apparently a lot of kids don't think that way. So do you think that by making home more inclusive is going to help attract talent as well? Absolutely. I mean, I don't have the stats at my fingertips, but there are there's lots of stats out there, lots of studies that talk about how um, the, the generations coming into the workplace now um, that they are prioritizing an inclusive place to work they want to work for cultures and places that are in, that are inclusive and where they they feel welcomed and I, I you know when I think that people are more uncompromising on that that than ever now um so yeah it, it's overall I think it makes the the workplace attractive but it also means that you know from from a very basic perspective looking at accessibility it means that you know we somebody joins us who um has has accessibility needs someone who is neurodiverse for for instance um they will have a better experience applying for a job and um progressing through the organization um if we focus on accessibility so you know that there's two aspects of it as well you know from a practical sense people will have a a better experience so i just wanted to follow up on this uh and uh, if uh, you look at it from a a gender point of view women in in telecom tend to be something in the region of 20 percent and then as you go up on the pyramid it's even fewer than that uh, do you have, uh, and clearly we cannot fix it in the short term. However, do you see that in the short, in the sort of longer term, do you want to get to a 50-50 type of uh, ratio, which affects the population, or should we just accept that maybe women are not all that interested in telecoms? And I know that this general uh, sort of very wide question, but do you have a sense of where we might be going to? Well, wow, there's 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 so much there to discuss, isn't there? Um, I think women are interested in telecoms. I, th- I think telecoms is a, is a great career for women and all of the different roles that within a telecoms organisation. At Colt, at the executive leadership team level, we are fifty fifty. Um, we're we're not through through all of the the different levels. I think at the at the entry levels, it's 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 a bit more balanced and 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 there's as in with lots of organizations um it's about making sure that 
women are able to progress through through an organization um as well as being able to attract women um would we would we go for 50 50 i mean that's not going to be fixable in in the in the short term we're at I think we're at thirty one percent now at, at Colt. Um, we each year, you know, we 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 set targets to to improve on that, and and the goal is to have a more balanced workforce. Um, in terms of where I think that organisations are going wrong, I mean, I I, th- I think that this is uh, like we talked about before. This is about society, isn't it? Society as a whole. Um, there are difficulties with um, women progressing through through organisations in in all different sectors, and um, more needs to be done to make sure that they can, that they are that they are supported, and that um, decisions made in in the people um, sphere are um, you know inclusive and equitable. That means what we talked about right at the start. So looking at policies and people processes and making sure that they are inclusive. Absolutely. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, I was going to say, in in many of the discussions we've been having, as soon as you put quotas in there, you know, it's like, well, it's sort of a bit of of ransom. You're held, held to ransom over it. And, you know, as long as it's as long as it's progressing in the right direction, you know, then, yeah. uh, and, and people, and I think that I think what occurs to me is that it's a a younger workforce, as you say, it's very local workforce. That the the attitude of the company is important. That cultural change is just is 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 so important. As long as you know, and and I guess with your Atos example, you've you've covered this that the the company is willing to put money behind it, you know, and actually make it happen because investing in it. And I don't think it's a massive investment, is it? But it, you know, it's it's a vehicle for for helping that change on the way. And yeah. the good thing is, of course, we know that the tools are there to make systems and websites and applications more accessible. And then, and as long as you, you within, and perhaps being a B two B company helps as well. That you know, because by definition, you have to work in an ecosystem, and you're more aware of what's going on at the end of the of the value chain. And that, I mean, would you say? suppliers in general of are increasingly receptive to being more and more dei focused yeah i i would say so um we we do talk to our suppliers as part of the accessibility work we've been having conversations with our our top strategic suppliers i, I had one about two weeks ago where we, we just shared a lot of resources and best practices around accessibility and it it was fantastic so um and and that that will that conversation will continue so i I do think there's a lot of openness to this definitely yeah it it does occur to me that in some ways we for the last few years we've had esg as being the focus which is the the financial metrics and the, the signs that that's people losing a bit of not not momentum but they're not quite as focused on it anymore and some of the ESG based funds are perhaps not not as getting as much coverage, but this is so much more. Well, this is the S bit, isn't it? This is the social yeah. bit of, of ESG. I've never thought of that. That the S bit actually translates into DEI. You know, for the um for for, for what we're talking about. Yeah, and of DEI that, is a big part of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it and it just means it's like you say, making a company much more attractive to work for, and they've created that because one of the things that we've noticed. And they're going to come back to collaboration and Teams and Zoom and all these things in a minute. But one mm-hmm. thing, obviously, we know is by people working at home, actually, a lot of people with different impairments got excluded mm-hmm. because working over, working over these things. We've we've often commented commented that the the shortcuts for for muting and and changing things on these are all, they're all different for all the different applications. Yeah, you know, let alone let alone people who are not perhaps not as quite as digitally skilled and using these things. And in fact, certainly a comment I've had from Atos before is that I often talk about audio, audio overload on these things because I'm getting mm. my screen reader talking to me while we're having these things going on. Mm. And, and Neil Milliken, you mentioned, said to me that how he uh, he got vi- video overload, so visual overload. And I'm yeah. like going, well, what's that? Because I can't appreciate that at all. You know, so, yeah. But that whole notion that what you're seeing on the screen can affect your 
you know, the way you communicate and the way you interact. You yeah. know, it's it's just, I, I, you know, and I think his example was he created an avatar, or no, his colleague created an avatar, which actually me, meant he actually then couldn't communicate. It's re- really interesting. Yeah, because that that was like a sensory overload for him. Yeah. That yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that I've heard a lot of people, and and a lot of people have actually asked me over the past couple of years, we're working from home slash hybrid environment is that more inclusive for people with disabilities or long term conditions? That's a great and, a- and actually, yeah. Yeah. you know, broadly. It, it is in in many many ways but i think i think people have been so keen to almost tick that tick that box and, and announce it as we're, we're, it's now more inclusive because we're working from home and it is more nuanced isn't it um you know i i know that there are certain assistive technologies that require such um high bandwidth that um that that might be more difficult for them to use at home than than at than in the office, for instance. You know, I I I, I had a gentleman who um w- is partially sighted and shared with me a story about how um he really really struggled with the, the pandemic because um his his guide dog actually needs the exercise to walk into the office, um. <laughs> And yeah, and you, you know so that, that there are examples of uh, like you say it, it's not a blanket improvement and you still whether you are working hybrid or from home or you're all in the office you still have to be um, consciously and actively inclusive and 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 um, and, and use inclusion as a basis for making people decisions well, it's, it's new i think more well, nuance is the right word to use isn't it mm. and, and we're getting into sort of quite quite deep into the weeds here but you know i think there are certain disabilities impairments where people can't travel into work where they, they struggle with it whether it's physically because of yeah. wheelchairs or whatever and it, or maybe some conditions where they just they, they struggle with the travel and struggle with being an officer so, great yeah. but it's that you know but we're talking because of because we're a technology industry, we think about the technology first rather than the people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that empathy around. Okay, we we'd love to employ you, you know, Monica, but we understand that you th- th- these are your conditions. You know, it's, it's that reasonable adjustment. You know, which is yeah. it, which people need to be aware. Of. I, I think that's a, re- a really important point about that hybrid hybrid work. It's not it's not black and white. Or, or it, it, yeah, it's much and, more and, nuanced. I think yeah. that we should look at the other way, uh, also the other way around too. Um, because I think that the crucial thing here is to be flexible. So if you need to work from home, you work from home if you can, because some jobs do not allow you to do that. If you have to go up on towers, then obviously you need to be on site. Uh, <clears throat> so be flexible, but some people might just need, uh, you know, when you look at it, they, they just need to have the, the direct the personal connection that you only have in person, and that's yeah. okay too. So uh, I think that we should just be open, you know, back to the, uh, equity uh, discussion we had at the beginning is to to see that not everybody has the same needs and we should be able to accommodate them to the point that it's reasonable and I think that just you know when we said reasonable adjustments the question is what is reasonable <laughs> and uh, I think that that's something that we should talk because obviously there are some jobs like you know if you have to go up on the, on the uh, on a tower I mean I have fear of heights I'm not the right person to do it you can make any adjustment it's just not the right thing for me to do. Just get somebody yeah. else. So, <laughs> sorry. How do you how do you go about? And uh, I guess I, <laughs> this is not a fair question, but how should we think about reasonable in this context? Because I think that's I think it's a legal term, isn't it, Rachel? Is it? Re- just- yeah, <laughs> we don't we don't we don't call it reasonable adjustments in court. We call them work, just workplace adjustments because reasonable is is a is a legal term and it's quite UK centric so we talk about workplace adjustments and actually um many times uh, people will self-select like you wouldn't go for that job monica to to stand on top of the tower you would self-select out of that opportunity because you know it wasn't for you but you know a lot of the time what we're talking about with workplace adjustments is um 
you know it, it, it might be you know if somebody has if someone's diabetic and actually they need regular breaks and they need to make sure that they do not miss their lunch and they need to make sure that they um have somewhere to put put their insulin in you know anything from just being a little bit more flexible um to um you know understanding you know in in some cases it might be changing um the the requirements of the role to 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 make to support the the person or it might be um that they need a piece of assistive technology like a, a screen reader or um something that that helps them with with their their writing um and actually once that once they they have that then they're they're absolutely thriving so um it's quite broad what what can be an adjustment but actually I think people can sometimes panic about adjustments and, and assume that it's going to be very complicated sometimes it, it's just actually quite straightforward and you know can just be an agreement between the manager and, and the yeah. the individual and, 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 what, and what's interesting of course is that what you've described is all the way from in my in my head I've managed to get rid of the picture of Monica up a tower. That I've managed to get rid of that now. But <laughs> you know, that the, the thinking about your Colts head office, you know, going in there and getting access, physical access, and people in wheelchairs or people like me that can't see their way around, you know, and it's it, it goes all the way from that through the systems, you know, through the websites, through the internal portals, and I I, I don't know what you do in, in Colt, but I was talking to one telco recently who said what they what they've designed from the internal point of view is the home screen when you log mm -hmm. on is almost like a Google search page. And, you know, you so you type in where you want to go and what you want to do, rather than trying to create this unbelievable, you know, morass of and mess of, of links and icons and stuff on a screen. And I thought, mm -hmm. actually, that's so sensible because we, we've, we've cluttered up the screens when we, when we think about the interface for people and actually nobody, nobody likes it. You know, you, you, you mm -hmm. ignore 80, 90% of it and you just go for the few things that, that you mm -hmm. use. I mean, I, I think that sort of almost Google search-like approach to to the to the intranet within a company is a a really interesting idea. Yeah, I I think so too. We've we've been we've launched a new intranet recently, and we we know that the search function is 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 super important. Just in terms of accessibility of of apps and portals, though, that that's really fascinating. I think because many companies get this wrong and um you know surprisingly I, when i started to, to look into this you know i was shocked at the number of even cons consumer organizations um exclude people with impairments by not having accessible websites and i mean it it, it i found it really really quite shocking and it's something that we've been doing at, at col is um building action plans to to make sure that our apps and our portals are accessible um because if you exclude people you know as, especially you know as if you're a b2z company you you you're basically removing some of your customer base aren't you so yeah. you know from that perspective it's like what why would you do that but uh, there's just not enough awareness about it there's not enough awareness about disability inclusion and accessibility as a whole i think in our society um yeah do you think do you think it's oh well okay. is there anything about the telecoms industry that, that is more makes it more difficult or anything unique to the telecoms industry i mean what we've just been discussing mm -hmm. for the last 10 50 minutes is very much could be about any business couldn't it you know about yeah. workplace adjustments and the like and obviously we're we're focusing on the telecom industry anything about telecom i'm not i'm not sure there is by the way i'm just wondering if yeah no thought. i'm just i my, you know i'm just thinking that through i i don't know if there's anything specific to the telco industry that make makes it um more difficult to drive accessibility um you know some organizations have have been working on accessibility for for a while i mean once one thing I would say about the, the telco industry is that, well, I, I personally, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably biased, but I do think 
it's a great industry it's it's a very collaborative industry some great people and in driving this piece of work at cult I've just it's been like pushing on an open door people have given the the budget and they've given the time I've had colleagues who have been so so busy on other programs but they've still said absolutely I'll make time for this so yeah it's 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 been great to work yeah. on this I think you you nailed it in your last comment about awareness you know this is about driving awareness and once yeah. you explain it to people and they go oh yeah we've been designing for you know a very a relatively narrow market yeah. and our assumptions about people's ability to you know go to websites find information you know yeah. is, is so true but and and I, I, you may not want to answer the following questions please feel free to to refuse it but do anything around the artificial intelligence side that that you see helping it because we i'm getting involved in a lot of things now and i'll give you yeah. my example of a i used my app called be my eyes to um to take pictures of people all the time now and it then it tells me actually gives away their age quite a lot which which can be quite dangerous you know to, but that whole AI thing about yes. interpreting pictures, using AI to find things as a, a sort of enhanced service, serv search engine, sorry. And anything around AI that, or anything, you, have you got any initiatives around AI that you can tell us about? So I'm definitely not an expert on AI, but I am fascinated on the, at the opportunity there is with AI, especially um, when it comes to enhancing accessibility. Um, there are some conversations happening at Cole, which I which I won't talk about um, for now. But I, I think that people are aware that it it's something that can can help accessibility. I I, I know that there's lots of research going on around AI right. and accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about uh, the external facing efforts. So clearly, reporting is not the same as doing it. Doing it is what matters, not reporting. But yeah. at the same time, uh, how do you see the efforts for reporting? And also, when you have, uh, you know, you're going responding an RFP, do they ask you what is your inclusivity or you know whatever sustainability policy? So. Yeah. On top of doing it because you feel good about doing it, is there sort of an external element to it? Yeah, and I would say that we're we're not just doing it because we we feel good about it. We we believe it absolutely makes business sense. Um, there are also like regulatory reasons why um, businesses need to to sit up and um, do more in this in the accessibility space. There were the regulations that um, are being strengthened and added um, globally. But when it, when it comes to reporting, yeah, I, I actually think the reporting is really important. Of course, you have to do the work and have the proof points and have something to report. But the reporting is important because it, it's important to be able to show your, your stakeholders internally and externally um, the pro progress and... Um, and that's a really big part of that and being able to to um, benchmark and, and compare how you're doing um, to, to others within, you know, your industry peers. Um, and yes, uh, you know, in terms of your your question around, um, you know, when we're, we're bidding for work and RFPs and the like, absolutely. Um, we have seen over the course of the past few years there's much um, more focus on ESG um, for from our customers. So, yeah, it it all links in. It's all links in and all all supports each other. It does, and that's what's nice about it. And I think what we found is that in the certainly when I started working you know, forty years ago, technology to do with with an individual disability was so expensive and so unique. Mm. So unique. Whereas now, because of the digital thing, actually we get more scale. And, yeah. and on on the procurement level, I uh, was certainly talking to Genesis at the MEF event recently. They said for public sector contracts, accessibility is absolutely mandatory. Yes, they it have is. to show yeah. accessibility. You yeah. know, and obviously they're in the contact center business, which you know they they do employ quite a lot of diverse people in there. So, but I think I think that is a it's a really important point, and I do like this notion of the evolution of ESG and you know the what it was was CSR and a bit of DEI and so on, and the, it's all it's all. I love the fact that it's shaping the culture of the company 
rather yeah. than just shaping the financial reporting, which I think is what ESG um, certainly certainly comes out as, and obviously all the greenwashing that we've seen and the like. So yeah, I'm I'm a uh, I'm fascinated by that. And and on your AI comment, absolutely no question. With with and and I'm sure we should ask Atos this question really that you know we're we're beginning to see tools through generative AI to test how accessible documents are, systems mm. are, processes are, you know, because it's a it's a massive data analysis job and that's exactly what AI and Gen AI are good at, that we mm. can use natural language in there as well as translation, you know, it's just, uh, oh, it, it's, it's going to keep on giving. And I like the way you, you basically did a plug there, Rachel, for coming back and doing this again when some of these AI products come to come to fruition <laughs> within Colt. So. All right, then. <laughs> Monica, over to you. Do you want to wrap us up? Uh, yes, we should wrap it up. And uh, as I said, uh, Rachel, you're always welcome to come back and uh, uh, share uh, uh, sh share it with us. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, all of you, for listening to us. And I would like to uh, acknowledge our sponsors uh, who are distributing our content. And we're working for uh, presentations and panels like we're doing with mobile uh, the Mobile Ecosystem Forum F uh, in uh, uh, Barcelona this year on February 25th, as I told you already. So thank you so much. And uh, you can go to uh, our webpage and uh, uh, see all the uh, previous recordings we had. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, catch up and uh, see all of them. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, Rachel, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. It was a great conversation. Thanks, Rachel. Take care.